Well, thank you all for coming out. I'm under absolutely no illusion that this is about me. It's about Taco. <laughs> but, uh, but it's wonderful to see so many people. And this is a fabulous thing that the Center for Desert Archaeology does. So I hope that uh, all of you guys are members. Or if you're not members, you're thinking about joining and supporting the center and bringing, bringing you more events like this. So um, as Doug said, I'm going to talk to you about Chaco tonight. And I guess, first of all, let me just get a sense. How many people have been to Chaco? How many people have been to Chaco more than once? <laughs> How many people are planning a trip to Chaco in the near future? <laughs> I won't embarrass anyone by asking how many have not been to Chaco, but obviously I'm with the crowd that most of you have some familiarity with what we're talking about. But maybe for those of you who, who don't, just really briefly, Chaco Canyon is a national monument today, which is up in northwest New Mexico. And it has been a very famous and important place, archaeologically speaking, ever since the late 19th century largely because it's the location of monumental architecture that the ancestral Pueblo or Anasazi people built between about A.D. 850 and 1150. And this architecture, as, as many of you know, there's um, structures that we call great houses that are three or four stories high. And because the Chacoans did such a fabulous job with their dry laid masonry, a lot of the walls are still standing a thousand years later. So it's quite a moving and impressive thing to go to the park today and walk through the buildings and look at them and think about what the Chacoans were up to all of that time ago. That's honestly one of the things that sucked me into archaeology quite some time ago also. I, I wanted to understand what made Chaco tick. And that was really the motivation behind what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this evening. Now, if you start dabbling in Chaco, you realize pretty quickly that the canyon, impressive as it is, is really just a part of the story. Chaco Canyon is actually the center of, depending on how you count, about 100 additional communities that are scattered across the surrounding area of northwest New Mexico and adjacent parts of what's today Utah, Colorado, Arizona. Uh, and these communities we call outliers. And these communities, much like what's going on in Chaco Canyon, will also have a great house. They'll have large masonry, subterranean or semi-subterranean circular structures called great kivas. They'll have associated small uh, communities of domestic sites. And so when we think about Chaco, we actually have to think not just about Chaco Canyon, which has great houses and great kivas and other kinds of monumental architecture, as well as small sites, but we also have to think about all these outliers and be concerned with, well, how does all of this fit together? How do these outliers have some relationship to each other and potentially to Chaco Canyon? Now, I'm guessing, as many of you already know, there's a whole plethora of theories about this. Um, there's uh, people who are much wiser and, and, and who've spent much more time thinking about Chaco than I probably ever will have come up or have studied this in great depth and have come up with a lot of different ideas as to how all this fit together. And um, like good archaeological scholars, many of us don't agree with each other. Uh, I don't know if I have tonight any uh, fellow Chaco and archaeologists out there who may want to raise their hands later and vehemently disagree. And if you do, that's all good, because for the most part, we do tend to get along and we enjoy uh, sparring back and forth and hashing out ideas. But uh, after perusing a lot of the different possible explanations for this whole Chaco phenomenon, the one that, that I gravitated towards and that I think has the most resonance is the one that posits Chaco Canyon at its height as a pilgrimage center, essentially. A place where people from these outliers traveled to. And when they traveled to Chaco Canyon, they helped construct the monumental buildings. And they participated in ritual events of various sorts. And they probably also traded with each other and maybe um, found somebody to marry from a different community. Um, they probably did lots of different things. But what made the whole thing run was the, the notion that every so often, and it might have been congruent with things like solstices or equinoxes, um, we don't know exactly, but every so often on a periodic basis, people from the outliers, many people from the outliers, would gather in Chaco Canyon and do stuff. And then they would go home. So that's the model that, that is the basis for the rest of the, the work that I'm going to talk to you about today. And it's a model that a lot of my Chaco and colleagues actually would subscribe to, although, again, not all. So if you're going to have a situation where you have all these people gathering together, 
my question as an anthropologist was, well, what's really making that happen? What, why are all of these people feeling like it's so important to come to Chaco Canyon? I mean, sure, it's a big, impressive, phenomenal place today, but in the beginning, not so much, right? So, so what was it about Chaco Canyon, or what was driving all of this? And in thinking about these kinds of processes, and it seems to me a couple of things are important. First of all, you're not just going to have people doing this willy-nilly, but rather there are going to be people who are probably coordinating and who probably have more social status, more power than others. Logically, in this kind of scenario, these are the people who are the priests of Chaco, if you will. And you know, we don't know if we're talking here about women or men or children or lineages or all of the above, but people in Chaco who probably are the ones that are actually organizing whatever ritual events are happening there and probably some of these people are also coordinating the, the major construction events that are happening there. And so if we follow that thread, we realize, well, those people probably have a lot more clout um, with the rest of the Chaco and social universe than kind of your average Joe from an outlier. So we've got power relationships there, so we want to investigate those. And when you start thinking about power relationships as an anthropologist, this leads you inexorably to think about ideology. Now, ideology has been defined in a lot of different ways, and the, the sense that I use, where I'm coming from with ideology, is I'm thinking about a shared group of beliefs that is enabling some portion of society potentially to have some sort of power over or inequality with some other portion of society. So these are pretty slippery ideas for an archaeologist to study, right? How am I as an archaeologist going to attempt to study something like ideology? Well, fortunately for me, uh, there's plenty of folks out there, especially across the pond in, uh, in Britain, who have actually chewed on this before I, I came around to thinking about it. And one of the things that is pretty clear is that ideology does have a lot of resonance in the material world. And you know, we, we live in a material world, um, channeling Madonna here, I guess. So we, uh, we, we, we make and use a lot of things. And one of the things, obviously, that's left at Chaco that we can all see and experience are the buildings. So couldn't there be traces of a Chaco and ideology in those buildings? This is not actually just a, a spurious idea, but rather there's some major anthropological or sociological thinkers, which if any of you are really inclined, you might want to look up the work of people like Foucault, okay, or Henri Lefebvre, who've written copious tomes on this very theory, on these, on these topics. So taking these folks as my starting point, I thought, all right, well, I think I should be able to look at the architecture, look at the landscape in Chaco, and understand something about the ideological forces that were actually drawing people together there. But I realized I'm going to have to have some pretty creative field methods for this. Okay, uh, It's not going to be that easy. And again, fortunately, I had some inspiration from across the pond where uh, some of our archaeological colleagues, people like Christopher Tilley, had been developing a method that he was calling phenomenological archaeology. So what does this mean? Well, the idea of phenomenology is centered in some 20th century philosophers that were talking about what it is to exist. And, and, and without going into a lot of um, esoteric detail, I guess, the, the kernel of it is that we're living in human bodies just like people were in the past. We have senses just like people in the past. We are you know, looking forward with our eyes, left, right, up, down, just like people in bodies in the past. Therefore, shouldn't it be possible for us as we move through archaeological spaces to catch some glimpse of what bodily experiences would have been like in the past? And some of you may be going, okay, that sounds pretty fringy. And in fact, I have many critics who say, yeah, that's pretty fr fringy. But let me tell you where, where I, I followed up on this and why I decided that this would be a really good idea to try to use this theoretical basis as a way to investigate Chaco. Many of you claim that you've, or told me earlier that you've been to Chaco more than once. So let me just ask randomly, and you can just shout this out. When you went to Chaco, how did you get there? What was your mode of transport? Anybody go to Chaco not in a car or truck? Anybody go by plane, boat, uh, parachute? No, OK. Everybody came in. Right, OK. How many Chacoans in 80,000 went to Chaco Canyon in a car? Zero, right? So I'm thinking about this as I'm walking around the park, you know, looking at the architecture, and I'm realizing 
our experience today of Chaco Canyon is completely circumscribed by the fact that we drive in on the Park Service Road, we park in the designated spot, we walk on the designated trails. We're not seeing Chaco as people did a thousand years ago. So I realized that what I needed to do if I wanted to practice a phenomenological investigation in Chaco was to walk into Chaco as the Chacoans did. Fortunately for me, the Navajo Nation and the Park Service were very kind in allowing me permits to actually undertake some of this work. And so I spent a couple of summers walking into Chaco with uh, various folks and also by myself uh, through some of the, the natural geologic entry points into Chaco Canyon, like through South Gap, which is between South and West Mesa on the south side of the canyon. And then I walked on the road segments that lead into Chaco Canyon. Now we haven't talked about road segments yet and we will get to them um, in a little bit more detail a little bit in a few minutes. Um, but there are these cleared linear alignments that don't necessarily connect Chaco with all the outliers, but they do form very, very formal routes of entry into Chaco Canyon. So um, one of the things I did, I figured, well, this must be how the Chacoans expected people to walk into the canyon. So I'll go ahead and walk along these two. And, you know, this is all very experimental, so I thought, how am I going to document this? And uh, I took a handheld video camera, and I was walking along with my video camera and, you know, talking about, well, what am I seeing? What am I experiencing? At what point can I see Pueblo Benito, for instance? At what point can I see Fajada Butte? What are the landmarks on the horizon that I'm looking at? Um, do I feel tired? Do I feel small? Do I feel exhilarated? What are kind of my feelings as I'm doing this? Now, obviously, I, as a... Well, that this was late 20th century archaeologist, I'm not a Chaco in person and could not possibly know really what they were thinking and feeling. But I'm trying to catch some glimpse. And I'm also fortunate in perusing this line of inquiry in that I was able to bolster it with another very, very important tool that all archaeologists use in the Southwest as well as elsewhere throughout the world, and that's um, ethnohistory and, uh, and ethnography. So we've certainly got thriving descendants of Pueblo peoples uh, living, of Chacoan peoples living across the Colorado Plateau today and across the Southwest today. And so I figured, well, I can also look and see what they have to say or what they have to tell me about the spatial organization of the world and architecture and mountain peaks and kind of how they experience their landscape. So that was another piece of evidence that I used to try to lend a little bit more weight to the phenomenological observations. And let's see, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I suspect I'm 10, 15 minutes in. Yeah? <laughs> well, keep going, keep going. Notes don't matter. OK, so, so where did all this lead me to? Uh, well, after doing my phenomenological investigations and after looking at a lot of the ethnohistory, ethnography, thinking about how Pueblo people think about landscape, it seemed to me like, we're done with these guys, it seemed to me like there were, well, we're not really done with them, but I'm done having you look at their names, never mind. Um, it seemed to me like there were, there were a number of major ideas or themes that, that were emerging from the work. Now, you could organize these in a number of different ways. And in fact, there was a point where I was pulling my hair out, trying to figure out how to kind of rigidly categorize them. And, and you can't, really. But in general, these themes have to do with directions. And they have to do with dualism. And they have to do with time. And they have to do with center place. Now, normally when I talk about Chaco, at this point I'm able to show a lot of really splashy pictures that illustrate my points, but you guys are just going to have to use your imaginations because I can't possibly draw um, what I want to tell you about. But I would urge all of you to go back to Chaco and, and look at some of these things yourselves on the ground and see if you can get some glimpse of what I'm talking about. So with respect to directions, Directions are, cardinal directions are really important at Chaco, and I'm not the only person to observe this. I mean, Steve Lexon infamously has observed this, many other folks as well. Um, but it does seem like north and south in particular are really, really important at Chaco. We've got this linear alignment that heads due north out of Chaco Canyon, the Great North Road, and then we've also got a linear alignment heading actually south-southwest out of Chaco Canyon, um, the South Road. Now, one thing that's interesting about looking at the, the North Road and the South Road is that there are the only two 
segments of Chaco roads that really are pretty long. I mean, there's lots of little segments around that are like a mile long, two miles long, but both the North and the South Road are about 35 miles or about 50 kilometers long. So they're about the same length and they're both really, really long. And the North Road heads due north and then ends, we cannot trace it, past a place called Coots Canyon, which is Badlands. The road drops off there. There's some broken pottery and things at the bottom, and that's that. Um, Steve Lexon's counter arguments notwithstanding. I, I, I keep challenging Steve, show me the North Road actually connecting up to Aztec. And he says, oh, you know, probably oil and gas developments destroyed it or something. <laughs> Can't find it. I don't, that may be true. But, but anyway, the, the farthest we can see the road is to the edge of this canyon. Okay? Um, the South Road goes fr through South Gap, right? This gap between West and, and South Mesa, and goes not straight south, but kind of south-southwest for about 50 kilometers and ends at Hosta Butte, which is a very, very prominent little knob on the horizon. Now, one of my colleagues, Mike Marshall, noticed a while back that, hmm, isn't this interesting? The north road goes to a down place and the south road goes to an up place. And they're equidistant and what's right in the middle, like a fulcrum, Chaco Canyon. So it's as if these roads are not just channeling traffic into the canyon, but they're also expressing the canyon as this point of balance between two directions. Okay? That's just one way in which directions seem to be pretty important at Chaco. And there, there are others as well. Um, vertical directions are also really important. And there's a lot of, uh, of, of argument that justifies this as, as a part of a Pueblo worldview that actually, actually it's, it's almost like a pan, it may be a pan Native American worldview that, that directions are very important. And not just north, south, east, west, but also up and down. The Zuni, for instance, talk about six sacred directions, and then the center place, the seventh direction, is the Pueblo, right? Well, at Chaco, you also have a pretty serious emphasis on up and down. They're marking up and down in all kinds of interesting ways. One of the most obvious ways they're doing this, great houses, great kivas, OK? Where do they meet? In the plaza. So again, Chaco Canyon is like the center or the fulcrum of directions that are going um, counterbalancing each other up and down. Now, if you're looking ahead to the second item here on the list, you're thinking, and that sounds like it's pretty balanced and dualistic. And you know what? It is. So again, it's really hard to separate these out into kind of separate categories. But the other thing that's really, really important, or one of the other things that's really, really important in Chaco is a sense of balance between things. So the directions are balancing, um, but so is the architecture in many other ways. And those of you who've been to Chaco, you know, here, let's see if I drew, draw in like really sketchy um, Pueblo Benito, the shape of it, symmetrical, right? It wasn't initially, but over time it was made to look symmetrical. Chetro Kettle, okay, symmetrical. So um, the Chacoans placed a really big value on symmetry in their buildings. The Great Kivas, also very symmetrical. So this is one of the additional ways, in addition to the directions, that balance is really strongly expressed in Chaco and architecture. Time is expressed in a lot of really kind of interesting ways. Many of you may be familiar with Anna Sophia's wonderful film, The Mystery of Chaco Canyon. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty old now. I guess it came out about 10 or 15 years ago. But uh, it, it's the best exposition that I know of, of her argument about the solar as well as the lunar significance of Chaco. And if you follow her arguments, it looks pretty clear that the Chacoans were doing a lot of things to emphasize the canyon as the center of the seasons, the center of the rotation of the sun, the stars, the planets, the moon. So in that sense, Chaco is like a, a temporal fulcrum as well. One of the things that I notice at Chaco is that there's constant remodeling happening in all of these buildings. And without, again, get up, going down a, a road and getting into a very extensive discussion about this, it seems like one thing the Chacoans are doing is they're constantly making the old new. So they're taking uh, a great kiva, for instance, that they just used 10 years ago, 15 years ago, completely refurbishing it and replastering the walls and rebuilding the hearth and making it new. And they do this repeatedly over and over and over again as if there's some kind of wanting to sort of touch the past but make it new and move into the future. So it's another way, I think, that they're trying to emphasize Chaco as the center of time. And all of this is really re revolving around the notion of Chaco Canyon as center place. You've got the roads, you've got up and down, you've got dualism. Uh, you've got balance, you've got symmetry, you've got time, you've got the, the sun and the moon rotating around the canyon. 
And you've got the canyon itself, which is actually geologically an amazing center place. Now, how many of you have been on top of Fajada Butte? Oh, wow, some people have. I'm blown away. I've never been there. Um, I'm not allowed to go. No one's allowed to go unless you have a compelling research interest. So you guys have seen Chaco from a perspective that I never have. Um, and I'm suspecting that a 1,000 years ago, most Chacoans probably didn't go up there either. It was probably, as I understand, it's a pretty rough hike. Did you guys helicopter in, or did you, <laughs> did you climb? <laughs> Uh, as I understand, it's a pretty rough hike. And so I'm suspecting that, that this is not something that everybody was able to do or that everybody was necessarily allowed to do. But if you haven't been on top of Fajada Butte, you've probably been on top of the north rim of the canyon, hiking up to Pueblo Alto. Or you may have been up at, at Sincletson on the south side of Chaco Canyon. And you know that the views from up there are really spectacular. Well, here's one of the really cool things about Chaco Canyon. You think of it as it's a canyon, it's a down place, it's protected, it's hidden, it's secret. But in fact, it's also a very, very prominent escarpment. That Chakra Mesa is a very, very prominent uplift. And in fact, it's one of the most prominent places in Northwest New Mexico. And once you know what you're looking at, you can see that place from all around. You can see it from the Abajo Mountains in Utah. You can see it from Mesa Verde. You can see it from all around. So Chaco is both a hidden place, but it's also a very, very high place. And if you were to get on top of Fajada Butte or up on top of any of the mesas edges, you look out and what you see are a series of very prominent peaks ringing the horizon. Places like Hosta Butte, places like the Chusca Mountains, um, places like uh, Huerfano Mesa. And so in that sense, Chaco would have been kind of the natural center of a geospatial world. So, and it also is playing with these same ideas of up and down and, and directions being marked. I'm convinced that the Chacoans did care about this because they marked a lot of these high places with shrines. So these are, these are places that were very significant to them in the past. So all of these things taken together, from my perspective, would have been part of a, a Chacoan or maybe even a, a Pan Puebloan and Anasazi ideology at this time. Everybody thought that it made a lot of sense to talk about the world being in balance, to talk about directions, to think about directions as being marked on the horizon, to think about needing to do ceremonies or rituals in a center place so that things would stay in balance. Now, I don't know exactly what, and we can never know exactly what it was that the Chacoans were interested in doing or what they believed, but I suspect, since they were agriculturalists, probably a lot of it was around rain and bringing the crops, making sure the crops would grow. Um, but there may have also been additional aspects of that belief that may have had to do with deities or you know, other types of things. Uh, but ultimately, I think what they were trying to do is keep everything in harmony, keep everything in balance, keep the, the, the moon and the sun turning, keep the seasons coming back. And the way you do that is you come to Chaco Canyon and you participate in the rituals there. And, but ultimately, of course, like any ideology, what this would have been doing would have been legitimating the power of the priests and the people who were actually living in Chaco Canyon. So everybody else ends up doing things that they believe are for the greater good. And in some sense, they are for the greater good. But in some other sense, they're also serving the people who are living in Chaco Canyon. So this is a way that we see power and inequality in a place like Chaco. And one way to try to study it uh, through the architecture and through the landscape that we have left to look at today. Thank you. <laughs> and Thank now you, I Ruth. will take all of your many questions. Okay. Um, once again, please raise your hand before you ask a question. Let me get the microphone to you. If you don't feel like talking on camera, um, there are pads of papers and pens on the tables. So feel free to write a question down. Um, pass them as I go running around, and I think it's time for me to start scurrying. So here we go. Well, I'm planning to go to Chaco in May because there's going to be an eclipse of the sun that will be visible from Chaco. It won't be total. It will be 95.5% covered by the moon. Uh, will That's the exciting. native local people have attached any significance to that in terms of Chaco? I don't know, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. Next question over here. I was just going to ask you about your 
opinion, if you have one, and if you've read uh, David Stewart's um, book, Anasazi America, and drawing parallels to the present and what's going on with, uh, like you said, the people serving the powers that be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. It's, that, it's been about 10 years since I read that book. Um, my recollection is that I had a lot of admiration for what David Stewart was trying to do in terms of getting people to think about the environment and environmental degrada degradation today in the Southwest. And it's really great when someone can, can turn archaeology to that sort of purpose and, and get people to think, perhaps, in a way that they otherwise wouldn't. On the other hand, as I recall, the premise of the book was ultimately that the Chacoans had overstepped their bounds environmentally, and that led to their decline. And that part I don't so much agree with. I mean, obviously, you know, they were farmers. They had to deal with things like drought. They may well have been overextending here or there. Um, so I don't want to say that none of, none, none of those things were a factor, but what I think ultimately led to the demise of Chaco was probably some kind of power struggle between people who were trying to maybe take a little more credit than the populace was willing to allow for um, making the sun and moon continue to do their thing and you know somebody that was maybe trying to become a little bit too powerful. We see, I think, some competition happening in the 1100s between Chaco and some of the other outliers, and then ultimately the whole thing kind of goes bust. So I think it's important to also keep in mind that there were social factors that would have been important in the collapse of Chaco, actually just like we have today in thinking about the environment, if you, if you really think about it. So, but good question. And I recommend the book, too, if people would like to, to check that out. Right over here. Um, can you tell us what you know about what was the population of Chaco at its height? <laughs> That's like the six million dollar archaeological question about Chaco. And if we knew the answer to that, um, part of the reason that I laugh and that we, we don't know is because one of the basic ways that archaeologists count people is we count rooms, we count, for instance, habitation rooms, but it looks like a lot of the rooms in great houses were actually empty. So we have a lot of arguments raging as to whether, in fact, we're misunderstanding what was going on in those rooms. If they were habitation rooms, we could have like, you know, 10,000 people. But if none of them were, we might have like, I think the lowest estimate is something like 200 people. But I think most people reasonably would argue, and I would tend to concur, that we probably had a couple thousand at its height at the max, OK? but. Um, it, it, there's a lot of variables there. So, and of course, one of the other problems is that we don't have the burials that would actually account for all of those people either. So, what were they up to with with the burials? So, it's it's a really really hard question to answer, actually. Uh, no. Thank you. Um, Hi. Given that these concepts are, were probably prevalent throughout. Pueblo and people at the time. Have you given thought, and if you have, could you tell us about your ideas as to why this phenomenon arose at Chaco? Was it strictly location, location, location? They were very precocious builders in the um, late 800s. They were possibly very skilled farmers, irrigators, unless they were building massive mortar pits. I mean, Gwyn, Gwyn, Gwyn Vivian's grid gardens. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, so what do you think was the key to this phenomenon arising where and when it Good did? question. Yes, I have given a lot of thought to that. And uh, to, to back up just a tad, I can't answer the question quickly, actually. In the, in the 800s, in the early 800s, most of the people in this part of the Colorado Plateau were actually concentrated up more in the Four Corners. And there were these huge aggregated villages. And then we see them breaking apart and often kind of violently, like around 820, 850. And we see, we think, Rich, Rich Wilshusen and Tom Wines and, and I have all argued that we think what happens is a lot of people head south and they start moving back into the San Juan Basin, which is actually probably where there was a pretty significant basket maker population, you know, a couple hundred years before. And some of these people move into Chaco Canyon and they're farming and other people move along the slopes of the Chusca Mountains. And 
the Chusca Mountains are actually, that's the place to be. I mean, the big question is, why wasn't Chaco over there, right? Because they've got the wood, they've got the game animals, they've got the water, they've got the arable land, they've got the lithic resources, they've got that pottery temper, you know, they've got all the, all the goodies over there. In Chaco, initially, they might well have had some pretty primo farmland too. And if you, if you look at the geomorphology, um, and Gwen Vivian has been one of the, the major people thinking about gardening and farming in Chaco, of course, it does appear that there was some kind of really big, I don't know, Cienega, you know, swampy area in Chaco in the late 800s. So you can see why people would have settled there. But then that started to dry up. And in fact, we see them trying to build a dam and, and retain it and unsuccessfully. Meanwhile, people over in the Chuscas, they're happy as clams. They're in their settlements over there. Everything's going great. But you have to also remember that these are now probably the, maybe the first generation descendants of people who used to live together in aggregated villages in the north. So they still have relationships. And in fact, we think that the origins of some of these ideas probably extend back to the Pueblo I period when people were living in these aggregated villages. So they probably wanted to get together and um, do whatever they needed to do religiously you know, every once in a while, and also to see friends and neighbors and kind of reestablish connections and trade and whatnot. And in the, in the beginning, this might have been kind of a rotating thing, um, but the people at Chaco, it becomes pretty clear in, in, as the 900s start to, um, as, as, as we start to make our way through the 900s and the Cienega starts to dry up, that uh, they're going to have to do something to keep the Chuscans coming. You know, the Chuscans are always going to be able to attract people over there because they've got resources, but what do the Chacoans have? And this might have been part of what sparked them to think, well, let's just throw the very best parties. Let's have the very best rituals. And look, look at where we are. We're in Chaco Canyon. This is the center of the world. We've got the high places, the low places. We can see all the directions. You know, it's really well suited. So they serendipitously might have been able to weave that landscape into these pre-existing notions and then kind of market themselves as this is the best place to be. Um, it didn't happen overnight, and that's one thing that we often forget when we're looking at, looking at Chaco. We, we tend to look at it as kind of temporally flat, like, whoa, look at all these big buildings. But we actually have about a 150-year buildup before we see you know, the classic Benito phase. And so those are some of the ideas that I have about what might be, have been happening over that period. OK, next question here. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if there's um, uh, a connection between the changes that were going on in the, the latter part of this period and any large-scale environmental issues that are, that are happening at the same sort of period of time. You mean at, towards the end of the Chaco yes. uh -huh. era? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, there were environmental factors in play. Um, the, 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 Chaco, the classic Benito phase is between about AD 1000 to about 1100, but in fact, during the latter years of the 1000s, um, there was a decline in precipitation and agriculture wasn't doing so well. And in fact, I suspect that's one of the things that might have led Chacoans to do things like found Aztec and Salmon, um, which then ultimately become, or Aztec becomes kind of a rival to Chaco because they're up there on the Animus River where there's all kinds of water. You know, what do we want to be down there in Chaco for? But then in the 1100s, um, between 1100 and I think it's 1135, Maybe it's 1129. Anyway, there's several decades of the absolutely most productive agricultural time, the best rainfall, the best temperature like ever in the San Juan Basin. And so corn production just goes through the roof. So Chaco bounces back. Hey, you know, our, our ritual leaders are still doing it right. And uh, we still have the best ceremonies and you need to come to Chaco. But meanwhile, you've got these people at Aztec going, but wait, we're on the river. You know, you need to come to Aztec. And I think there's some back and forth there. And ultimately then, by the 1140s, all of that goes south. We enter another dip, another period of uh, really poor moisture, really poor rainfall. And um, you know, nobody's doing well. And at that point, Chaco's over. Wasn't that the same period as, as one of the longest, most intense droughts in the entire southwest? Um, the great drought was actually a century later. But there's actually been a number of pretty long, intense droughts, yeah. So, yeah. And you know, what are you going to do when you're a farmer and, and something like that rolls around? You're in big trouble. Next. He's got to bring you the mic, so. Okay. So other people can hear. <laughs> I recently finished the uh, Steve Lexon uh, book of the Southwest, and he has a strong view that at the de demise of Chaco, the kings of Chaco moved down into the Phoenix area and set up their kingdoms in the Phoenix platform mounds. 
What is your uh, view on that? <laughs> Do I have to answer that question? <laughs> You know, I love Steve. Steve is like this great gadfly of, of Chaco and scholarship. He comes up with these really outré notions, partly so that we'll think about them. You know, what if? I mean, how would we actually try to you know, address something like that? I, I, I don't actually think it's a good idea to call the leaders of Chaco kings, because I don't think that they're analogous to what's going on in, say, medieval Europe. Um, is there some relationship, though, between what's happening in Chaco and, I don't know, classic period of Ho'okam? I've got, there's Ho'okam scholars in the room. They should really answer that, uh, not me. I guess, I think that one thing that Steve Lexon does that's really productive is it, it, he encourages us to think broadly, you know, and regionally. So, undoubtedly, people did know about each other, and certainly things that were happening in Chaco may well have had ripple effects and vice versa. So in that sense, you know, I would agree. But in the specific sense of kings moving to Phoenix and setting up shop, no, not, not so much. <laughs> you can tell Steve I said that too, it's fine. <laughs> Actually, he's, he's backpedaled on that himself. Um, if yeah. you're interested, you can go to www.stevelexon.com and oh, read his new book yeah. Um, yeah. as it's being written. And you can, you can see how his ideas have changed in just the past uh, six or seven months. Next question. Um, how do you see the residents of the small house communities fitting into the great house peoples and how and, and if you could touch on any cultural differences, any ethnic differences, as you well know Gwen mm -hmm. believes these were southern people and this was sort of a boundary zone. But also the other would be what their if it was a social Function. So anyway, just on, on whatever, however you might see that. Another good out. question, and, and a major Gwyn proponent here. I should, uh, in full disclosure, Gwyn was actually my, my PhD advisor, and uh, I don't. When are you here? He was making noises about possibly coming. Anyway, so I have the utmost respect for his opinions and, and his long history of Chaco and research. He knows more about Chaco than I ever will. Um, that said, I've never been too keen on the whole two ethnic groups notion. I tend to think more that the people in the small houses, they're, they're domestic villages. I mean, that's pretty clear. And I think initially there probably wasn't a huge amount of difference between the people that settled on the south side and the north side of the canyon. And then ultimately, you know, as many others have argued as well, ultimately what happened was those folks on the north side, they were able to transform themselves into these elites. Whereas the people on the south side, they probably still were more important than your average schmo from an outlier because they're living in Chaco. But I think in general, um, Bioarchaeological studies have shown that, in fact, they didn't have as good of nutrition as some of the skeletal remains from people from some of the great houses. So I think, in general, they probably weren't doing as well. You know, I suspect if we had more, if we had, well, we have lots of data, but if we, if we, as we continue to say this, what we may well ultimately see emerging is, you know, a whole hierarchical kind of situation where you have small house sites in Chaco that are actually. Um, better off than small house sites, say, in a distant outlier, but worse off than people in, in the great houses in Chaco. So I would tend to think it's more about, um, about I don't know if I want to use the word class, but about kind of different access to material and nutrition in the 10 hundreds as opposed to different ethnicities. Next. We stumped everyone. <laughs> Okay. At Chaco, they uh, perform inhumation, right? Uh, yes. Isn't there an alarmingly lower number of inhumations than should be for a population of that area? Yes, and that's, um, as I was mentioning earlier, that's one of the, the factors that really cause us to scratch our heads when we're talking about how many people were in the canyon. It's one of the reasons why Chaco makes sense more as a pilgrimage center that filled up with people and then emptied out periodically because we don't have enough people to account for you know, thousands and thousands of people to have lived there for hundreds of years. So yeah, that's a big, that's a, a big gap or a big mystery still. Okay, just playing devil's advocate. Okay, done. Um, what if it isn't a vacant ceremonial center? What if, how would that change your findings? Um, I or would it at all? Well, 
I w it wouldn't necessarily. I mean, I would still argue that people are coming from the outliers because you clearly have a relationship there. Um, maybe they wouldn't. Maybe the construction of the great houses wouldn't depend so utterly on the labor from people from outliers. Maybe it'd be those people on the south side, you know, from the small sites that are that are doing it more. Um, I would think though that if it's not vacant, that we would we'd have the burials. You know, we'd have more evidence of habitation, which we actually do in the 900s and in the 1100s, but not in the 10 hundreds. So, um, so, so I would I would. To me, that's a problem, you know, and that's why I, I tend to favor crowds coming in, crowds going out. But the overall notion of an ideology holding the whole thing together doesn't necessarily disappear if you have more people living in Chaco all the time. Okay. <laughs> One back here. Hi, um, can you, um, there's, there's a lot of variability in the outlier world around Chaco. Can you dissect those outliers in the same way that you dissect Chaco Canyon with these variables of dualism and um, centrality and directionality? I mean, can you see that play out across the entire um, landscape around Chaco itself? I mean, are people bringing this back from their pilgrimages and seeing this and doing this in their own communities as well? Yeah, you can actually. Um, one, of the, one of the issues though is that the outliers are grievously understudied. I mean, we've excavated, well, we, people over the last century or so have tested or excavated maybe like nine, okay? And we know of about 100, probably about 60 or 70 of those are pretty well mapped and the communities are pretty well investigated, but the rest, not so much. So we actually have a very, very, very incomplete view of of what's going on in, the, in many of the outliers. A few of the more dramatic ones like Kin Klejin, or I'm sorry, like Kin, um, yeah, Kin Klejin, Kin Biniola, uh, Kin Ya'a, they're actually part of the park now because they have preserved standing architecture. And um, one of the really dramatic instances, I think, of a juxtaposition between up and down, verticality being really important, is at Kin Ya'a and Kin Klejin, both of which are outliers that contain what we call tower kivas. And this is where you have actually, within the Great House, you have a stack of four kivas, one on top of another, going up four stories. What more dramatic statement could you have? What more dramatic illustration could you have of the importance of something that's subterranean, but that now is also vertical? And my colleague Mike Marshall, again, also pointed out that doesn't that fit quite nicely with the more um, ethno-historic and contemporary Pueblo stories about emergence through successive worlds. You know, there's a little hole in the bottom of the kiva that goes to the world below. Anyway, so there may be something like that going on there as well. But the notion of nested, layered worlds, certainly there at those outliers. Things like symmetry, things like memory, time, um, those are there as well. And so really, Sarah, that's a whole other paper. <laughs> but, but the short answer to the question is yes, it's there, but it needs to be further explored and, and better understood because it probably changed over time and understanding that those kind of traces of those ideological ideas in outliers may well change our conception of what's going on, you know, in the bigger picture in Chaco. Um, is, there, is there any evidence that tells us much about the relationship between men and women in that culture? We need to do so much more work on that. Um, we've been grievously remiss, I think, actually, as archaeologists in thinking about gender in Chaco Canyon. And you know, I'm constantly scratching my head trying to figure out why that is. Um, my colleague Kathy Cameron actually has been working on this recently, so she may have something to say. I'm not, I don't want to put words in her mouth because I'm not sure exactly what she's going to say, but she's been, she's been thinking about this more recently. Um, but it's, it's kind of bizarre, and I think Part of it's just because it's so difficult for us to even kind of identify men and women sometimes archaeologically. I, but I, I've been prodding my, my students, you know, this is a gaping hole, so we need to think about this, come up with some creative ways. And in fact, there's one student I know that recently came up with a kind of creative way of thinking about grinding corn and if we're going to associate that with women's work, what was going on potentially where you have these big mealing bins in um, great houses like at um, Pueblo del Arroyo. Uh, so could you have, say, women coming together from the outliers and they're grinding? And do we have a way to maybe, you know, study that further and think about the implications for that in terms of, like, ritual in Chaco Canyon? So people are thinking about it, but we haven't done nearly enough. 
So all of you guys that need research topics out there potentially, you want to run with something, that would be a really, really good one. Okay, we have time for one more question. I've read of a number of high status burials in the Southwest, one at Grasshopper and one at Flagstaff, and I'm sure there's others. Do you know of any that were female high status burials? Thinking. Um, in, in Pueblo Benito, in room 33, which is where the, the two guys are under the wooden floor with you know, more turquoise that's been found you know, anywhere else in the entire Southwest, practically, it, above that wooden floor, there are, and I'm going to get the numbers wrong, something like 28, 29, the, the kind of disarticulated remains of some 28, 29 people. And a lot of us are thinking that what might have been going on there is some kind of like ancestor cult where they're actually reopening the burial room and putting in more bones, and that's how those bones are getting moved around. And some of those adults are women. I don't remember how many offhand. Steve Plogg is actually... Um, has been doing a phenomenal job going through all of Pepper's notebooks and actually organizing a lot of this information that hasn't been available before. And he's got a great website. Uh, it's the Chaco Dig Digital Initiative website. I'm sure you can Google that and you can find it. And uh, you can probably get to more information about those specific burials that way. So I would encourage you to, to follow up on that if you're interested. But as far as like the magician's burial in Flagstaff or something like that being female, not that I know of, but Maybe somebody else knows. Not that I know of, though. Okay, thank you. Sure. Actually, that website's been, the name's changed. It's now the Chaco Research Archive. Okay, thank and you, Doug. <laughs> Doug's on top of the web. <laughs> um, if you ever have a, have a chance for some free time and you want to poke around and learn stuff about Chaco, they are doing such an amazing job of putting um, Gwen Vivian's father, Gordon Vivian's handwritten notes that you can simply go, sit down and start reading about accounts of, of excavations of various Chaco insides. It's absolutely amazing. Ruth, thank you so much. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure to be here.